It's something we've spoken about in the past, the idea of self-awareness, the idea that a person has to know themselves, even though we can never fully know ourselves. We have to try as much as possible to know ourselves. And when I mean know ourself, what do I mean? I don't only mean to know our strengths and our weaknesses, but also to know our triggers and to know what influences us. In other words, many times we make decisions in our life and we think they're decisions, but they're not really decisions, they're just reactions. They are patterns of behavior that we've developed within ourselves. And then something triggers us, so we just go into fight or flight mode, and we just go into automatic pilot, autopilot, and just do whatever the next thing is. So you take me off this way, that triggers me this way, and I will react this way. And everything just becomes a system. It just becomes a pattern. So most of us think that at that moment we're choosing. What do you mean? You got me angry, so I chose to be angry. But we didn't. We didn't really choose. If you chose, chances are you would cho choose dignity over anger. And there's nothing dignified about anger. So, self-awareness means to truly know what makes me tick. What are the influences of me? In other words, not only what is my nature, what is my nurture, what has life done to me in order to turn me into what I am and how does that affect me? Now, it doesn't mean I enter a blame game. It doesn't mean, oh, wow, now I realize I'm damaged, so I start holding grudges against my parents and my teachers. What it means is just to be aware, just to sit with that awareness, to sit there saying, okay, I was hurt in this way. And when I was hurt in this way, my brain interpreted the hurt this way. But now I'm an adult. I'm a big boy, I'm a big girl, I'm, I'm, I'm an adult. And I'm able to look at that story and say, okay, that wasn't right, what the person did. But my interpretation of the event also wasn't right. Even if they were malicious, I didn't have to interpret the event as that I'm worthless, that I should be defensive, anger, whatever reactions I developed at the time, although they were not done maliciously by the person or by me, or they were done maliciously, the point is, I can't live with that anymore. It's not serving me well. That narrative I chose then, which now triggers certain reactions by me, doesn't serve me, so goodbye. Or if it's not so easy to say goodbye, I'll go to therapy until I learn how to say goodbye. But fundamentally, I am going and exploring my makeup. I'm exploring my anger. I'm exploring my defensiveness. I'm just exploring why I'm such a faribaldic a person. I'm exploring why I'm so generous or so stingy. Is it my nature or is it my nurture? I'm exploring my patterns of behavior, why I fall into certain unhealthy patterns or healthy patterns. You know, some people just happen to fall into healthy patterns. They have good friendship and another good friendship and another good friendship. Other people fall into bad patterns. Bad friendships, bad friendships, bad friendships. Some fall into both. But the point is we all have patterns. Some of the patterns are serving us and some of the patterns are not. Where are they coming from? And that self-honesty, to just look at it, to not get defensive about it, not get angry about it, not get resentful about it, and not even be fooled with self-pity, but just simply to own it is what self-awareness is in Judaism. Honesty. Pure honesty with oneself. We've said this before, the quote that uh, Rabbi Shalom Dov Ber of Lubavitch, the fifth Chabad Rebbe, told his son when his son turned bar mitzvah. He says three things. To be an adult is three things. Don't fool others. Don't let others fool you. And don't fool yourself. That is so much of what adult is. It is so on point. Don't fool others. 
don't let others fool you. In other words, don't be naive, but also don't be a player. That balance of being wise, but not being manipulative, and don't fool yourself, which is most probably the single most important one. Because gosh, we try so hard to fool ourselves. Because it is so painful to accept our weaknesses that will come up with anything. It's not my fault, it is my fault, but, but, however, yesterday, tomorrow, it's not so bad. I know I have an anger problem, however, people have to deal with it. I'm a good person anyway. Um, they, they love me, etc. We sit there compensating and just creating excuses so that we don't have to face the music and sit there saying, Yesh li baya, I have a problem. What's the first principle of AA, of Alcoholic Anonymous, and all the other anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, etc.? I have a problem. I am an alcoholic. Why is that so important? Because until I cannot say I have a problem, there is no healing. Period. How can you change if you don't even believe that you should change? If you're not willing to sit there saying, I have a problem and I need to change. Change is fundamental of what it means to be human. In order to really have a quality human life, I have to be evolving. I have to believe in evolution. Not evolution that I come from monkeys, but evolution that my character has to evolve. But unlike evolutionary theory, which just says it happens automatically, no, I have to consciously evolve myself. I have to mindfully evolve myself. Day in and day out, evolve, become a better version of myself to become less animal and more human, not in my look or in how straight my back is, as all the images of evolution show, but rather in my character. An animal is impulsive. A human has the power of mindful and lack of impulsivity, controlling impulsivity. When I am impulsive, I am animal. When I act from a place of choice and mindfulness, I am human, and I want to be human. So self-awareness fundamentally is I want to be human and therefore I want to choose in my life. I don't want to be a robot that just gets rea reaction after reaction after reaction. I don't want to be predictable because animals are predictable. Human beings should not be predictable. They should be consistent but not predictable. In other words, consistent in doing the right thing but not predictable in the wrong thing. Predictable means I trigger you and I know how you're going to react. Consistent means you wake up every day at a similar time and you get, today, you get your life together. And you consistently work on yourself. But how you work on yourself each day is different. But if you're predictable, that I know I say X and you'll react Y, it's an animal. Not you're an animal, that's an animal behavior. That's animalistic. A human being thinks before they react. And unfortunately in our time, self-awareness is more lacking than it should be, and we need it more than, we need, than ever before. The paradox is that you cannot live today a quality life without self-awareness. Because of the challenges of life, you have to have honesty to be able to face the challenges, to be able to develop grit, to be able to rise to the occasion. If you're sitting in, in a life of abundance and life is fantastic and great, yeah, maybe you'll become a narcissist and people won't like you, but ultimately you won't necessarily realize that you need to become self-aware. But in times of difficulty, if you don't become self-aware, you crash. Your relationships get strained. Why? Because it's that person's fault. You're making my life difficult. Your choices are making my life difficult. It's because you can't get your life together that my life is difficult. Instead of saying, yes, my life is not ideal. However, why am I so triggered by it? Why does difficulty get me so down? It's interesting. 
I'll give you an example. Money. Money is one of the single biggest issues of conflict in, in couples and in life. When I get angry about money, I have to ask myself a simple question. What is it about money that triggers me so much? Most marriages throughout history struggled in poverty. Most marriages weren't in abundance. So why is it in our time that most marriages that collapse have a money element to it? Yes, ideally, everyone should have what they need. But what happens with money, money ultimately, for many people, becomes a sense of identity. I am what I have, and I am not what I don't have. In other words, what I don't have means I'm lesser. So money literally destroys relationships and creates a, a, a tension in the family fabric. But it shouldn't be that way. Why? Because money is just a thing. Now we might say they're saying, yes, but, however, but ultimately, what's being triggered within me? What's my relationship to money? Now, interesting, I didn't grow up in abundance, but thank God my parents gave me what I need. And I've met various different people with different relationships to money. I'm not talking about charity now, I'm talking about relationship to money. And I'm not even talking as a financial counselor. I'm talking simply as a human being and about relationship to money. And I've learned something from my own experience. The more you crave money, the more money runs away from you. The more your identity is about money, the more money runs away from you. I'm not saying that it happens all the time. There are many people who crave money and do do well. But there's no question that if you're struggling to, to money, you have to ask yourself a simple question. Why am I chasing it so much? It's almost, think of an analogy, if you're chasing a guy or chasing a girl and they feel that you're becoming needy, they'll run away. Why? Because the approach is unhealthy. It's just like, like yeah, yeah, just give me space. It's not as if money has a mind of its own, but when we're chasing money, we're not thinking with clarity. We're thinking about now, not tomorrow. We're thinking small picture rather than big picture. So we make decisions that are very instant rather than long term. And money is a long term strategy. So I'll give you an example. If you get a job offer who offers you very small money and you get another job offer who offers you more money, which job do you take? Well, if you're not self-aware and you don't really work through your relationship with money, you'll obviously take the job that has more money. But it's not so simple. Which has better opportunities for growth? Which has a place that I can actually actualize myself? See, because here's the thing, if I could truly actualize myself, eventually I'll make all the money I need. And yes, I'll have to bite myself for a short while over here, but there is room for growth. But if all I could think about is this month, then I can never think about the long term. And then I can never make decisions that come from a place of mindful. I remember there was a certain stage I had to leave a job. And pretty much I was left with no job for four links field job. And leaving that job was, was hard because ultimately for the next few months I had to live on loans and gifts. But it was only when I was able to say goodbye to the previous job and say, you know what, you don't hold me just because you offer me money. You're not working for me, you're not nurturing me, you're not nourishing my spirit. It was only at that moment that I was able to say, okay, now let's look for something new. And Baruch Hashem eventually found a job, which again, wasn't the ideal package from the beginning, but slowly but surely. My point is, and I, I've made millions of mistakes in that, but when I think of relationship to money, I think of a unhealthy space that we all need more self-awareness of. 
specifically in this culture, in the Joburg, Jew, Johannesburg Jewish community culture, there is a unhealthy relationship. I'm not saying there isn't an unhealthy relationship in other places, but this place definitely doesn't have a healthy relationship to money. This sense of identity that comes from money, depression when there is no money, toxicity, etc. Self-awareness is asking yourself, why am I so about finances? My grandparents didn't have anything. And yes, life was a little strange, but the, ultimately they made a life. So why by me is it collapsing me? And the same is true with education, etc. You know, I just saw a video, as you know, if you've heard from me before, I'm not the biggest pro-college guy. I'm not anti it. I'm not pro it either. I think if you know exactly what you want to do, and in order to get that career, you need to go to college, then go to college. So in other words, you know you want to be an uh, actuary or a doctor or a lawyer, go. But if you don't know what you want and you're just going to college because you need an education, for me that's absolutely ridiculous. Go get a job. Get real life experience and you'll figure it out. You don't need an education. And I believe that with all my heart, and if you look at the top five billionaires of the world, none of them have an education. None of them. Not Jeff Bezos, not Mr. Microsoft, Bill Gates, not Mr. Facebook, and not even the fellow from South Africa. Why? Because ultimately, why do many of us push our kids to go to college? Because we develop the narrative that that's the way to do things. So we just, we're not asking ourselves, why am I doing it? Am I doing it because I'm actually encouraging them to build a future? Or am I just afraid? I'm full of fear. Okay, just in case, just in case, just in case. Make sure you have an education just in case. Why? Why do you need an education just in case? Get an education because you need it. If you don't need it, then don't get an education. Go get a job. And yes, you'll start at the bottom. So what? You'll build up grit, you'll build up tenacity, you'll build up character, and eventually you'll do well. And if not, an education won't help you with that. Again, I'm not anti-education. I'm anti-education if, if you don't even know what you want it for. Or if you're doing it just because you're scared that there's no other way to make a living. Give me a break. There's a million of ways of making a living. You have to figure out what you want to do in life and do it. So my question to, to us today is, how many of the things we tell ourselves and tell our children and build our life around, how many of those ideas are actually healthy? And how many of those ideas are coming from a place of our sickness? When I say sickness, I mean emotional sickness, hurt, and maybe thinking that was molded by, by the circumstances that I lived with but aren't objectively true. I just see how many parents burden their kids with hurts of previous generations, and it's not the child's hurt to carry. Just because we were affected a certain way doesn't mean we have to now pass over our narrative to the next generation. True maturity is to say, yes, that's the way I developed the narrative in my childhood, but now I'm an adult and I don't want this narrative to go down to my kids because this narrative has not served me well and it's not going to serve them well. So whether it's a narrative of fear, my gosh, South Africa doesn't have a future, let your kid make that decision. I don't I get why parents feel this impulsivity to push their kids to emigrate. Like, give me a break. They're adults. My parents never told me to leave the U.S. They never told me to go to South Africa. Once I decided to go to South Africa, they never told me not to go to South Africa. Let your kid make a decision. Why am I imposing my stuff? The only thing I should try to impose on my children, not even impose, educate, is values. That's the only thing a parent is there to teach their kid, I believe. Values. Other than that, garnished. Not what job to take, not what occupation to take, not not anything. Yes, you should encourage them to get an education. You should encourage them to, to know what they want to do. You should help them. But you shouldn't chart it for them. Back off. Let them make mistakes. 
tons of mistakes and let them develop their identity but I should not bring my fears unto them let my kid make that call let my kid think it through some people convince themselves that that you know a tight family is where the parents tell the kids what to do or where there is this enmeshment now the greatest gift we could give our kids is to stand back give them values and then trust them to live their values again these are some examples i could go through a gazillion examples of so many decisions we make we spoke about money we spoke about parenting we could talk about a million other examples where we think that we have a thought out worldview, but the truth is it's not thought out, it's just impulsive. It's our circumstances that molded us. Education, in general, how to parent, how to have a marriage, how to see ourselves, our self-worth, all this stuff, is it thought through? Is it coming from a place of mindful and health? Or is it coming from a place of impulse? and unhealth. So that's what self-awareness is. As we head into another season, another term, between Pesach and Shavuot, the second term of school, whatever area of life you're in, challenge yourself over this time to start becoming self-aware, to start being a person who's less predictable and more thought out. To, uh, to be a person that makes decisions based on values and not based on hurt and circumstances of the past. Learn the lessons of the past, but don't be defined by the past. Learn the lesson that the stories of the past have to teach you and then throw it away if it's not serving you anymore. Because that's the only way that intergenerational trauma does not go to the next generation. It's the only way that we can truly allow our children to stand on their own two feet rather than imposing us on them. And the greatest gift you could have is not when your kid's 45 living at home, but 45 totally independent who calls you once a week or once a day, whatever, not eight times a day, and says, hello, how are you, dad? How are you, mom? I'm great. I'm struggling, but I'm great. I'm, I'm doing fine. How are you? And maybe not the Jewish mother's ideal, but it truly is the greatest gift you could give to them. Shkoyach, everybody, and thank you so much for joining.